far as volunteer training and engagement. Um, you have to provide guidelines for your fosters and volunteers. You, you have to. You need to know where your dogs are and how they're being taken care of and if, if the fosters and volunteers are complying with what, you know, every dog's individual. There are certain things that you can, you can want across the board, but there's a lot of customizing depending on the dog's personality, temperament, and, and that kind of thing. Um, it, it's so crucial that the volunteers communicate with, with us on a regular basis, even if they're having issues or problems with the dogs in their care. Make it clear that fostering or volunteering are on your terms, the rescue's terms, and that, you know, and, and you're setting the bar for what the expectations are for that dog to be able to receive while they're in that care. Um, if you're depending on these people, you need to know where things are and, and, and where you stand. It should be made clear up front, you know, that you have to make the rules. They need to be followed for the safety and well-being of the dog, the community, um, other animals, and um, to avoid duplicating efforts, appoint someone to kind of coordinate that so you have um, somebody that they can go to and then you can always put it down the chain of command. If you've got somebody that's ha uh, having problems with separation anxiety, fighting, give it to somebody who's better versed in that. And you know, have a support system of trainers also to help with that too. Um, you need to hold regular training seminar seminars and um, workshops and volunteer programs. This is us on the hottest day of the summer last year. <laughs> on my side street, and thank goodness we're coming up on a creek right there in the water <laughs> where everybody collapsed you know, with backpacks and laid in the water. Unfortunately, one of our volunteers got attacked by a mass of bees and was stung. Oh. Nice. <laughs> but the dogs truly enjoy it, and if you give them something to do, you can see, obviously, they're tired, they're hot, but nobody is reactive to the other dog. Mm -hmm. They've got a job, they've got a mission, and they respond well. This is with nominal, nominal handling for the troops. Um, basic obedience and understanding dog behavior and how to incorporate that into day-to-day -day training are basic skills that promote healthy relationships between the volunteers and the dogs. Um, this past February, I had a uh, animal behavioralist, uh, Beverly Morgan, come to the house for about a six-hour seminar and we went over the importance of leadership skills. I can't stress that obedience training is absolutely a must, but that's not all there is to it. If you don't have leadership skills and understand dog behavior, dog mentality, um, it, it's not going to work. Uh, far too many times everybody's humanizing and, and making their dogs be children, so to speak. You can't, they, we can learn to think like dogs, they can't learn to think like humans. And most times dogs will, the light bulb will go off once they get it, once they know they can divert to uh, a leader and there's nothing in the equation to make them think that they have to override or make an attempted coup for that top position, most of the dogs I can honestly tell you are okay with that. Very rarely do you have one that will try to buck the system. And, and you can get them. You can get a hard head that just says, I'm not having it. But, and I'm not talking about corporal punishment by hitting or beating them, but there are other training methods that you can make it clear. Proactive, positive reinforcement for the good behavior. And once they see that and make that decision their own, it's golden. It works. I see it work all the time. Um, that make it clear from the start, you make the rules, um, and <coughs> Beverly trained under Jan Fennell, who I thought might have been a little bit odd, but I saw a great need for what she was advocating. The leadership, the confidence, helping the dog come to his own realization, and obviously positive proactive reinforcement of those things so you know that they're finally getting it. So that makes a big difference. And then, um, like I said earlier too, the dogs see it. They take great pride in getting it right and wanting to please the owner. And it's empowering to <coughs> the owner, the handler, the foster home too, to see something tangible work. And that's nothing but a good thing. Um, 
this was another training seminar we did in late October. Um, it was a three hour workshop of dog handling with a good friend of mine, Danny Davis. Um, and also we've had previous training um, workshops at Curry's Family Pet Care in Romulus. Pat Curry is on our board and he's phenomenal. Um, this helped to work with the dogs in public and in you know, groups with other dogs. And as you can see, nobody, this is Joby. Everybody, Joby's been with me forever and probably is not going anywhere, but he thoroughly enjoyed it. He was probably one of the best dogs there. And normally he's not a real social creature, but he definitely did phenomenal with them. Um, encourage foster homes to be proactive, work continuously, you know, the five to 10 minute, multiple sessions a day, and um, work on the leadership skills along with obedience training, not just obedience training. Everybody says, oh, he's obedience trained. Well, that, that's fine, and there, there's a need for that, but there are other, there are other issues with dogs that you need to, need to address. Covered it. I'm sorry, honey. I'm trying to get ahead of myself too. Um, this is what we call weekend foster home enrichment in my shower. <laughs> um, they are, our volunteers. We have some of the best volunteers in the world, and I'm proud and honored to have them with us. They help immensely with the dogs. I work um, in that medical field, and I'm gone sometimes 12 hours a day. We have to have somebody come in to let them out to exercise them. If they, to give them potty breaks, and then we have our weekend days where they get bathed, we do big cleanings, big yard pickups, um, nail trims, ear cleanings, that kind of thing. So these are three of the best volunteers in the world. That's Stacy, Nikki, and Jennifer. Um, and even though we're in, <laughs> even though we're in, you know, they're in a foster home, um, you know, it's hard to take them in to um, bring people into your home to do it, but we had to. We just we just had to. So they had they have to follow strict guidelines and regulations and stuff that we set up, and they have to be experienced with the dogs that are in the care and very proactive with the employee. Okay, Diana. Right. Uh, do their people loving nature? Pit bulls do not, many of them don't do well in long term kennel situations. Warehousing dogs in boarding kennels with little to no human interaction for months or worse yet years on end does not rescue, it's cruelty. I'll say it like I see it. Uh, mental deterioration, refusal to eat, hiding in the back of the kennel, temperament changes, all signs of kennel stress. Kennel stress can turn a wonderful dog, a happy dog, into a miserable, unadoptable mess. Addressing their physical and emotional needs. Uh, is such a cohesive and integral part of rescue and should not be ignored. Kennel enrichment uh, is engaging animals' minds and bodies through a variety of mental, physical, sensory activities. Casa del Toro, uh, they're fantastic. They're out of uh, Indiana. And they have uh, established a kennel enrichment program um, and, and they are sharing that information with the world. And I think it's phenomenal. And everybody needs to get on their website and take a look videos, you know, samples of the treats and stuff they make. All volunteer based. Um, <laughs> some begin the, uh, some dogs uh, will continually pant, pace, growl, mm -hmm. lunge at the door. Uh, they begin to retreat back into their kennel, appearing as if they've just given up all hope. These are all signs of kennel stress, and kennel stress is something that can be avoided and can be helped. Uh, kennel enrichment programs help improve the quality of life of shelter dogs increases chances of getting adopted. Spending time away from the noisy kennels in a quiet environment helps dogs de-stress. Activities may include basic obedience, problem-solving puzzles, grooming, agility training, massage, play groups, talking soothingly to the dog on a couch in a special room, and having snuggle time. Uh, physical and mental stimulation releases this pent-up energy and helps provide a positive redirection of high energy levels, which we all know these guys can have. Uh, kennel programs should also expand on the social experience for the dog, not just keeping them in the shelter or kennel facility. 
You're not going to get an accurate assessment of the dog if they're just totally contained in the shoulder. You have to know in a less controlled environment how the dog's going to respond. Is she relaxed, comfortable, extremely stressed? Once you answer these questions, you'll know what areas you have to continue to work on. You want to start one of these programs, volunteer base, at your local shelter or even within your rescue, like what Joni is doing. Reach out to other reputable rescue groups. Reach out local trainers. Look outside the box. Be innovative. Again, Cass Del Toro has a great program information, and these links will be available to you afterwards on our website. And Animal Farm Foundation, if you've never heard of them, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. Uh, they also have kennel enrichment. And believe it or not, they have an internship program for shelter staff uh, three times a year. I, I'm trying to remember when they are, but you can get online and check that out. There are over 20,000 pit bulls listed on PetFinder.com right now. In Michigan alone, there are over 600. That seems low to me. Yeah, that seems low. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think they're all they're all not, they're not the boxer <laughs> much. Could you address that, please? Um, what the PDRC model is for for addressing that? Because what I'm noticing is a lot of rescues are saying lie or iron mix oh, or yeah, the breed ID issue. Don't lie. <laughs> yes. I people need to know what they're getting. If, if, they, yes, if you, you have to know, the dog adopted, you're not helping. But and most what happens is this. I've seen this over the last nine years. They call you, me. What do you mean by people? Well, the poster that was on the table yeah. in the other room during, during the uh -huh. other session, any of those, or just glancing at them, yeah. any of those dogs could be labeled pit bulls. Yeah. Yeah. That's an error. So it's, right. I don't think people are not labeling them because they're afraid to label them. Some I think they just yeah. don't I know. Trust me, some I would have looked at all. I would have looked at all of those dogs yeah. and said, well, all of them are pit bulls. I, I agree with you. Have to and that it, wasn't If it looks like a pit bull and acts like a pit bull, oh, it probably has some pit bull in it. Even the experts disagree with the breed identification issues. Yeah. Even the experts disagree with the DNA testing. Yeah, yeah, I've heard people yeah, say DNA, DNA is right, DNA is absolute crap. I've heard it both it's ways. Only, it's only going to pick out mixed breed dog. Yeah. Is, is, is mixed breed dog. Yeah. You do what, 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 what it is in your best power to do. If you need help with identifying breed, uh, a dog, send out pictures. Get other yeah. help from other yeah. people that are knowledgeable in the breed. Get somebody to come over and look at it. Um, are you going to hit it 100% of the time? Absolutely not. <laughs> These dogs are everywhere. They're, they're breeding everywhere. They're, they're mixing everywhere. I mean, you know, there's great mixes and, there, and there's not so great mixes and there's mixes that are just plain incorrect. I've had people come up to me at tables before and say, this is a bulldog such and such mix. Looks darn well like a pit bull to me. <laughs> you know, I can't. I, it, it's a crap. <coughs> you had a pit bull DNA test. I mean, she was a bit, right? I've been dealing with dogs yeah. for, you know, the better part of 20 years. Mm. And she was a pit bull and her DNA test came back on this dude. So mm. you can yeah. just crazy. That's why I've heard, you know, some of them are better than others. Well, because they are not. Because the breed doesn't mix itself. Right. <laughs> it always has structure. The facial structure is a young dog look. You know, interesting. I'm sorry, you're, you had a question. I want to speak as a veterinarian, but people at the same site, they're not pure <coughs> they're mixes. And we, okay. the best way to call them is the feed good type of dog. Right. Uh -huh. Right. Oh. Yep. But, yeah. that, but, but with BSL, that's why it's important. Because if the animal control officer comes over and goes, that's a pit bull, the dog's gone. Yeah. This is why BSL doesn't work. Right. right. Uh, but we yeah, also why we have to be extra careful when we're calling a, a pit bull mix or something else. So again, uh, do what you feel is right. Um, don't intentionally lie. If you um, accidentally have it listed as something else, that's especially puppies. You know, you know excuse me for interrupting, sure. but a perfect example of that is the chart that you saw in the other room identifying the pit bull. And I think what's happened, I, I, I think it may be changing somewhat now, but you're seeing shelter personnel who intake these dogs and because they're trying to save another dog or because to them in their in their mind this looks like a lab mix so the problem i have with the the, the testing and that is 
who's making the, assu the assessment of what the dog is, and the shelters are adopting out far, far many, far more many dogs that have pit bull in them than the one that may look more like a pit bull that does, if they, you tested it, does not have anything in it. So unfortunately, and they're so worried about the liability for adopting a pit bull out, but yet they've adopted hundreds, if not thousands of dogs out because they were trying to save one, and thus, you know, there's more of them out there than they think. They think their method of being able to have a novice uh, intake worker say, oh, here's a pit bull mix, he's brindled, he's got a big head, he's got a short coat, he's got a big pit bull grin, um, you know, broad chest, or, or anything else that they use to make that call. Unfortunately, you know, I don't see it as, it's not racism, it's breedism, you know. Yes. I just want to make well, sure you get on to your presentation so I can yeah. get all the questions. Yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah, we're um, um, back to getting your adoptables notice. The pictures, top quality, uh, important, very important. Um, look at that one. Uh, that's, that's Coco after that picture went up. How long did it take for her to get adopted? Not long. She was with me for quite a while, about four years. She had some bad pictures of. <laughs> for a long time. Aww. Great shot for a puppy. My oh, gosh. No. That just, how can you resist? And look at this dually, super senior smile. Who can, who can resist dually? And the kissable face of Coltrane. Aww. I just, you know, that just a personality, personality, personality. I can't stress it enough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and biology, one second, this will not do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, how to tell the owners want to know as much as possible as the dog about the dog you listed before committing themselves. Avoid a negative bio. You know, only focuses on the dog's sad story. Keep it keep it positive. Uh, list your dog's favorite activities. Is he a big clown? Does he have a favorite toy? Uh, learn your trick command. More info you provide to the public, your pop, your pit bull's personality, the more likely to get noticed on Pet Finder, which again, like I said, how many thousands? You're, you're, comp you're competing by a lot. Uh, more, you, uh, we have also found including dogs' weight really helps them get adopted, but believe it or not, uh, people's perceptions and interpretations of what small, medium, and large mean are very, very wider. Uh, video showcasing dog temperament. Uh, if you haven't updated your pictures in three months, time to do so. Uh, don't you have time, resources to get great pics or write great bios? Just ask. Volunteers and past adopters to help you spread the word. Uh, if you're looking for help with photos, videos, or writing, uh, some people out there can't foster. They would love to help in other ways, such as this. Uh, there's tips, uh, pbrc.net, uh, great tips on photo and bio writing. Another fantastic resource, I see too many people not using, Pitbull Rescue Central, pbrc.net. Fantastic, information, information, information. They are a virtual shelter, they have volunteers that will pre-screen your adoption applications for you. Uh, okay, people have forgotten that this resource is out there or aren't aware. Take advantage of it. You can list your dogs online for free. Must be spayed neutered. That is a mandate. You must prove it to them. Your volunteers are all over. They will pre-screen those apps for you and give them you their opinion. Good at bad at what. It's up to you to make final decisions. Um, don't set your dog up for failure. Uh, public misconception of the breed. Media hysteria has put the weight of the world on all our shoulders for every pit owner. Let's uh, restore the reputation uh, of the breed. Rescues and shelters need to strive to place the be pit bulls with the most, best, most responsible adopters possible. Irresponsible mistakes lead to proliferation of breed specific laws. Spay neuter, need we say more? <laughs> Don't take the chance of adding to the overpopulation of these dogs by sending an out and intact one. Rescue should always spay neuter pit bulls adults prior to adoption, no excuses. Spay neuter contracts don't work. Unless you're asking for a hefty refundable deposit, $100 or more, and even then, you need the resources and time to verify that they're doing it. Don't leave it to chance. Uh, shelters that are not able to spay neuter understand. Uh, give them, provide low cost spay neuter clinic information to adopters to encourage compliance. When possible, enlist out the volunteers to make follow-up calls, maybe even help transport dogs to and from sterilization appointments. What about pups? We recommend foster to adopt contracts for puppies that are too young to be sterilized. 
Once the sterilization is done, the adoption is finalized. Uh, BSL, check for it first. Don't waste your time and the adopter's time. Check for BSL in their city before you go any further. We don't recommend adopting a dog out to someone that lives where BSL exists, even in a city that has restrictions only. Why? Because once you make a legal distinction that pitbulls need to be managed differently than other dogs, it opens a door you may not be able to close. And a city that already has restrictions can easily ban them later when the place see the restrictions aren't doing, working to prevent dog bites, which they don't anyway. Uh, <laughs> we can find an updated list of Michigan cities and their pitbull laws at my blog. Just put up there, it's got alerts, it's got who's got what, where. It's never gonna be all inclusive. Nobody, no one person can keep up with all of it. But it's been updated. Avoid placing dogs with a renter. Too often rental properties will not allow pit bulls or they'll change their minds after the dog arrives. Mm -hmm. Another rescue here in Mission again experienced this, wasn't that you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you do decide to place a dog with someone that rents, owns a condo, lives in a modular home community, get written proof that the landlord or condo association will allow pit bulls, don't accept, I'll just lie and have my vet call him a boxer mix. Please, I have heard this so many times, it doesn't work. <laughs> the animal control officer or condo association board member comes by and pit bull, out. <laughs> Multiple dog homes, consider placing pit bulls as only dogs or with one other dog of the opposite sex. That's ideal. While some pit bulls may get along with other same-sex dogs, those cases are more of the exception than the rule. If you do place a pit bull in a home with another dog, essentially the adopter already has good control of their current dog's behavior, manners, and training. Don't place the pit bull or any dog, I don't care what breed, into a home with a dog that has behavior or training issues. If they can't take care of their current one, how are they gonna handle two? Biggest challenge with placing a pit bull is owner education. Every breed has their pros and cons. Potential adapters must show they have a clear understanding of the breed challenges. Uh, putting a pit bull in a responsible home with adapters to understand the challenges is key to a long-term successful adoption. Uh, ultimate pit bull parent is someone that has breed experience, realistic expectation, understands the importance of not setting the dog up for failure. Ongoing training, monitoring, of all dog-to-dog -dog interactions. Encouraging good breed ambassadorship is key. Most importantly, good pit bull owner will not rush head first into situations that can put their dog at risk. Okay. We're at the end of the time here, and I don't think there's another one ahead of us, uh, after us, so we'll try and get through as much as possible. Uh -huh. We are having the 3.30 round table. <clears throat> round table? There's two. Okay. One on rescue, pitbull rescue with Joni. One on BSL breed specific legislation with me. They're both at 3.30. So unfortunately you have to choose. <laughs> you can always count back those. Successful adoptions. Oh. You're not done yet, are you? No, we're not. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Just a couple more minutes. A potential adopter insists they know all about pitbulls. You need to you need to see proof of that. They should be able to tell you what they know about dog aggression, brain drive, energy and they should be willing to listen to any additional breed information you want to give them. A lot of future behaviors will be predetermined by the groundwork set by the rescue or, or shelter going in. As with any breed of dog, behavior evolves as the dog gets more comfortable um, in its new home and as the dog ages, do everything possible to facilitate a successful and long-term adoption. Stress the importance of exercise. Encourage adopters to do socializing, um, training and proactive uh, pro practice proactive leadership. These need to continue throughout the duration of the dog's life. Um, there, most people, unfortunately, uh, they aren't as proactive as they need to be in managing their dogs. Prevention and monitoring is key. You don't leave pit bulls along alone with other dogs or animals, especially if you know he's already exhibited a high prey drive. Contains, and this is Pepsi, and that's what contains her. So unfortunately, five foot, six foot, and four foot cyclone and privacy fence does not stop her, so she usually has to be on a tie out. Um, emphasize the importance of containment on the, on the adopter's property. Encourage adopters to add locks to gates. 
um, to prevent accidental escape or entry by somebody looking to even steal the dog. Electronic fences, I, I, they don't work. Um, it's not so much about keeping the dog, your dog in, but what's to keep something from wandering on. Obviously, most police departments, I know my cops have told me, if your dog does anything to anybody on your property, there's no problem with that. But you still have the civil component of this by somebody still wanting to pursue that. So, um, you know, these guys have a high pain tolerance, and when they're fixated on something, they're going to go. Even Boston Terrier Rescue recommends against using them. They have, Boston's a low rate for them. Electronic fences do not prevent other dogs, people, children from coming into the yard. Monitoring is key. Um, if you have a multiple pit bull home, the dog should be fed separately in crates. Adopters should continue to monitor their activities indoor and out. Stress to, to, stress to the adopters the importance of not setting them up for failure in this VSL lawsuit at the environment that we're dealing with. Um, breed advocacy and responsibility. Education is paramount. Education is key. Proactive. Um, you know, um, you have to you have to keep. It's a work in progress. It's not going to stop. Just when you start to feel comfortable, something else that is, is going to get thrown in there. On you. It's not just about moving the dogs. We've got an underlying responsibility to the breed to advocate for these dogs by educating the public about pit bulls. Every chance we get, we're being dissected and overly criticized. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. Um, we have to help restore the image of these noble dogs. The breed's reputation is, is in everybody's hands. Um, this, is, this is Thunder, one of our dogs. Um, and he is also now a therapy dog that goes into hospitals and prisons now. <coughs> His parents were, are awesome. Um, you have to offer your adopters classes and other resources post-adoption. You still have to have a support system in place to give them the help they need. Um, do everything you, in your power to facilitate a successful long-term adoption. I don't want the dogs coming back. Empower the owners. Help them understand their dog's better. Give them tools and direction, and they need to respect and understand how a dog thinks. Offer adopters resources to help train their dogs, encourage them to go further with agility, therapy dogs, CGC, weight pull, dog diving, all kinds of things. Oh, yeah, I know. And owner give ups. Nobody gave Moose up. That was one of the puppies, and his ear still does that. <laughs> um, take time to listen to these people when they call you. I know it's really frustrating and you know, I, I get very impatient with the calls that come in, especially after a 12-hour day, and I still feel compelled to have to call them. Um, when you get the call or email from an owner who wants to give up this info, don't just tell them you don't have room. Get a history. Try to give them a, try to give them something else to go on. Maybe even ideally, we're going to try to help them keep the dog. The best place for that dog is with that owner. There's nobody beating down doors to take two to seven-year-old pit bulls. You know, um, so you, you have to be respectful and, you know, sometimes you have to be sustained and to the point with them as well about the reality of this. And most of the times when I do that, um, they, thank, they thank me for taking that extra time, even though I'm tearful sometimes in the conversation and they're tearful, but at least I told them the reality, you know. Um, you can refer, um, if you don't have time, which we understand happens, uh, you can also refer uh, people to give out their pets to positive impact for pets. Uh, where it's a new Michigan-based uh, de uh, nonprofit dedicated to keeping pets healthy and safe by providing one-on-one -on -one counseling, resources, information. It's strictly educational, and I am a proud volunteer with them. Uh, it strives to reduce the number of pets abandoned, surrendered, euthanized for, for non-medical reasons by giving them assistance with uh, resources to find assistance from behavior problems, medical expenses, housing changes, general cost of care. Uh, so we're trying to work with the rescues and shelters out there to help them prevent keeping the dogs uh, from the shelters and rescues. And I think we may be probably down to the